Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Vazadin. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show. I am so excited to have Megan Doyle on with us today. Hi, Megan. Hi, Amy. Welcome to the show. We're going to talk about genetics, mosaic embryos, and your fertility. And this is something that I wanted to talk about with you for such a long time. So welcome. And I want to tell our listeners a little bit more about you. You're a genetic counselor specializing in infertility, pre-implantation genetic testing, and preconception genetic counseling. You are the in-house genetic counselor at Markham Fertility Center in Ontario, Canada. And after seeing patients who came from other clinics where access to a genetic counselor was not available, you saw the negative impact this had on their care. And so you've now joined Instagram to help provide education on fertility, genetics, to help bridge this gap. And I'm so glad you're doing that. I swear, when I look at your Instagram posts, I feel like you like can read my mind. You're <laughs> really passionate about genetics and you work so well together with patients. They can feel empowered to make decisions about their fertility treatment and those decisions are the ones that are best for them. So thank you, Megan, for joining us today. It's so it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. So I want to hear more about you. Like, what made you go into genetics? Well, I always knew that I wanted to be in a profession where I was working with people. And as soon as I did my first undergrad lecture in genetics, I loved how it was working to understand why we are the way that we are. And, you know, the more I learned, the more I realized how it wasn't that straightforward, but really at the basis of everything, genetics are the building blocks for why we end up the way we end up and why we are the way that we are. So that's really what drew me to this field. And it's just such a lovely combination of science and learning and then working with people and individuals to make sure that they're getting good health care and working with a wonderful healthcare team at the same time. So it's just a wonderful experience for me working in the scientific community and still being able to help individuals at the same time. What are mosaic embryos? How would you describe that term mosaic embryos to someone who knows nothing about genetics and may think of mosaic and then think of maybe some tiles in their bathroom? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So I like to think of mosaic embryos like a soccer ball. So if you think of an embryo, we usually think of it as a bunch of cells, hundreds of cells big. And mosaic embryos Some of the cells are chromosomally normal with normal chromosomes inside of them. And some of the cells have abnormal chromosomes inside of them. So they're really like a mixture. Some of the embryo is normal. Some of it is abnormal. So if you think about it like that soccer ball, there's patches that are different from one another and it's not all uniform in that way. And how do you find out you have a mosaic embryo? How does that information come to you? You can really only find out you have a mosaic embryo if you do an IVF cycle with pre-implantation genetic testing. And this is a test where we're able to take a small sample from the embryo. We take between five and 10 cells from the area of the embryo that's around the outside and eventually would develop into the placenta. And since we're sampling a multiple cells, we can get a representation of all of those cells in the chromosomal makeup. And we learn that there's a mixture. It's not completely normal. It's not completely abnormal, but it's a mixture of both. And so you really need to have PGTA, that pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy in order to find that type of information out about your embryos. And it's also very important that the PGTA lab that you're using uh, reports on mosaicism, as this isn't something that's always available at every lab, um, and that it's requested because at some clinics, it's not information that they're um, requesting. So you need to make sure that it's something that's being offered as part of your PGTA test in order to get this information. Can you give us a very simple sentence that a patient can use to advocate for themselves with their clinic? to find out if the clinic is going to reveal mosaic results and the genetic testing company is also going to be able to test for that too. Yeah, I think that most most fertility physicians at this point that are using PGTA are probably familiar with mosaicism as a concept. So you can just simply ask, um, is the laboratory, the PGTA laboratory that we're working with going to report mosaicism back to us? 
that was easy. <laughs> That's <laughs> so easy. That's so Absolutely. easy. God, I have so many questions for you. So how are mosaic embryos ranked? Are there different kinds of mosaicism? There is. And this is something we've learned a lot about over time. Um, we rank embryos based on the level of mosaicism. So the percentage of cells that we tested that are normal versus abnormal. And so embryos that are low level mosaics have a lower percentage of cells that are abnormal compared to high level mosaics, which are more abnormal. And generally, we think of low level mosaics as between 20 to 40% abnormal high level is 40 to 80, but those um, ranges are changing. And sometimes we're thinking maybe a 50% threshold might be a little bit better. Next, we look at the type of abnormality in the mosaic embryo. So if you think about each chromosome kind of as one big um, instruction book for the embryo, you might have an entire copy of that instruction book that's present in a cell that's extra or missing. Or there might just be a few chapters from that instruction book that are missing or extra. And it's um, something that we look at. We call those segmental mosaics. If it's just a segment of a chromosome that's missing or extra or whole chromosome mosaics, if there's an entire copy of a chromosome missing or extra. So we also look at the, sorry, we no, also no, look no. at the number of abnormalities in a mosaic. So is there one, two, three, four or more? Uh, and then the specific chromosomes involved that are abnormal as well. So we're here talking about mosaic embryos because obviously I'm passionate about this, you're passionate about this, but the reason why I'm so passionate about this is I'm worried that people don't know this information and they're discarding embryos that could turn into perfectly healthy babies. Right. So how can that happen? Like, how does that happen? And, and, and tell us more. That's one of my favorite questions. I love it when people ask me if mosaic embryos can become healthy babies because they absolutely can. And it's so important to know that. Um, what happens is that the embryos actually are correcting themselves. That's the leading theory for how they're becoming healthy babies. If you think about the embryo as, uh, as a whole, it's a mixture of normal and abnormal. For the embryo to become a healthy baby, the abnormal cells are actually dying off. They're not as healthy as the normal ones. So the abnormal cells will slowly die. And as long as there's enough normal cells in the embryo to kind of fill in those gaps, you think about a soccer ball, it's got some holes in it, normal cells come in and patch it up. Then that embryo is now completely normal and it goes on and becomes a completely healthy baby. And that's really how these embryos are correcting and becoming completely healthy babies is that the abnormal cells are just going away very early on in the pregnancy. And is there any testing in pregnancy for someone to do to find out if their mosaic embryo is now a normal baby? Yeah, absolutely. And it's something that's completely optional because it is something that um, does come with some risk. So the best test for a pregnancy that's resulted from a mosaic embryo is what we call an amniocentesis. So this is a test that we do in the second trimester of pregnancy, usually after the 15th week. And it's a needle that goes through the abdomen of the person carrying the pregnancy. And under ultrasound guidance, we remove some of the amniotic fluid. In that fluid are cells that come from the baby, skin cells, bladder cells. And so we can directly test the genetic material that's coming from the baby and see if there's any mosaicism present or if everything looks great. And that's really the best test when we have a pregnancy from a mosaic embryo because all of the other tests that we usually consider for average risk pregnancies, blood tests, ultrasounds, um, even something called a chorionic villus sampling that's done a little bit earlier in pregnancy. All of those tests are looking at placental DNA. And sometimes, but especially when we think about mosaicism, the placenta and the baby can have different genetics. And the placenta is actually a little bit more likely to harbor those abnormal chromosomes to protect the baby. And so we really need to make sure that if you want reassurance about the health of your baby after a mosaic embryo transfer, that we're doing an amniocentesis and directly testing cells from the baby and not the placenta. And I think, sorry, just one quick question on, along those lines. If you're doing an amniocentesis, everything comes back normal, you have a normal baby, should you still be worried once your child's born that that baby started as a mosaic embryo? 
really, if everything's corrected, there's not a lot of need to worry. Um, you know, it's it's a lot easier for, for me to, to know that these things are easy because I have a great understanding of the biology at the early embryo stages. But really, if all of those abnormal cells are dying off and we truly have an embryo that has fully corrected and there is only normal cells, then there really shouldn't be an impact on the health of the baby afterwards. Everything should be completely normal. And that's what we're seeing from the literature so far as well. And, and I love that what you're sharing is based on the science, based on the evidence, based on your experience. So it's very comforting for, for me to hear someone with your background say the same thing that I've been saying for <laughs> years now. So at last we're here. I mean, I don't we think we could have had this we could have not had this conversation five, six years ago. The time no, is now. I probably wouldn't have been having this conversation 10 months ago. <laughs> wow. Wow. So for people who are trying to conceive, are there some indicators they should be aware of that might mean they should consider genetic testing? It really depends on what type of genetic testing you're thinking of, because there's so many different genetic tests. And um, a lot of the time I think about um, there's genetic tests you can do on the people who are planning to conceive, and there's genetic tests that you can do on embryos. So genetic tests we do on people who are planning to conceive. Um, really, you can consider um, genetic tests on yourselves um, if you are having trouble conceiving because of azospermia. So if there's no sperm or very, very, very low sperm count, it's a good idea to do some genetic tests on the, uh, on the sperm provider. Um, and as well, if there's any family history of genetic disease, then it's important to speak with a genetics professional to see um, if there may be a risk of that genetic disease being passed on to your future children. Um, we also think about doing genetic tests before conceiving in individuals who are experiencing recurrent pregnancy loss, um, both to see if there's a cause we can identify and to see if there might be any risks to the health of any children that are conceived as well. And it can help with determining treatment Anybody who is in a relationship with a blood relative and they're conceiving together, so if individuals are cousins and they're having a child together, which is common in certain cultures, they could consider genetic tests before conceiving to see if there's a higher genetic risk for them. Um, sometimes we consider genetic tests on individuals with premature ovarian insufficiency as well, again, to identify causes and explain things for them. And then I also think just personal interest, and especially for PGTA, when we think about testing on embryos, there have been various guidelines and, and studies done about which populations it's most beneficial for. But I really am a believer that it should be offered to most individuals unless there's a, a contraindication where it may be harmful for, for you and your fertility treatment. I think that as long as you are educated as to the reasons it can be helpful and what it can do, what it can't do, and what the risks are, I think it's something that, that people should consider or, or, or should be offered. I agree. I, I think it's important for everyone to be offered PGTA and then it's up to you to decline it. Absolutely. But I feel like um, sometimes people make decisions for their patients that they yes. wouldn't have made had they been given all of the information up front. And that's, you know, why we're here talking about this stuff. So thank you. That's right. So what are the myths and misconceptions about mosaics that you'd like to set straight before we finish today? I have... I probably have so many. I think the, the <laughs> first one that actually came to mind was, was kind of high level versus low level mosaics. And usually in, in my experience, sometimes people see high level and they assume that that alone means that the embryo is, is bad or is going to have a poor success rate. Um, but really when I'm assessing mosaic embryos, the first thing that I look at is, is it a segmental mosaic or is it a whole chromosome mosaic? Because in our clinics experience, in the literature, I think this is one of the first things we learned about mosaic embryos is that segmental mosaics have the best outcomes. So they have the highest pregnancy rates, the highest chance of leading to an ongoing pregnancy and live birth, whether it's a high level segmental mosaic or a low level segmental mosaic. Being segmental 
automatically puts you up into the kind of best uh, category of mosaic embryo with the most likelihood of success. So I think the level of mosaicism being the most important is one of the biggest myths out there with patients and providers sometimes. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Let me just ask you one question about that. You're se- saying segmental for our listeners who don't know what segmental means. Can you kind of t- n- tell us like how you would look at your report to see if you had a segmental mm-hmm. Absolutely. So it depends on your laboratory. Um, Really, you might see things that say dupe, D-U-P, or DEL, D-E-L, for deletion duplication. Um, You might see um, the letters P and Q, which talk about the different arms of the chromosomes that might be deleted. Um, And lots of really the segmental results look a lot longer. Um, If they're whole chromosomes, you really just see a plus, a minus, and then a number. Um, whereas the segmentals, they, they look a lot more complicated than they actually are. Great. So keep going with your myths and misconceptions. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I want to hear more. No, no, that's, that's totally fine. Um, One other thing that people think a lot about is we think about embryos that are totally abnormal, um, and that's completely related to the age of the egg provider. And mosaicism, on the other hand, is not. So mosaic embryos, the risk of those does not increase with age. Um, We don't actually have a great understanding of why mosaicism happens, which is very frustrating for a lot of people, especially individuals who seem to have a large number of mosaic embryos. Um, There's early data that we're kind of trying to figure out why mosaicism happens and if certain people are more prone to it, but age is not a factor for mosaic embryos. So I like to reassure individuals that they're not at risk for two different types of potentially abnormal embryos just because of age. So that's something that we like to think about too. Megan, I've learned so much from you today. Thank you for joining us. I really appreciate your time. So for people who are listening and they're like, where can I find Megan Doyle? Tell us where we can find you. Right now I'm on Instagram. You can find me at Megan Doyle GC. It's uh, Megan with a G and H M E A G H A N. Um, Right now I'm just there. So um, we just finished a big series on mosaic embryos. I have a feeling it's not over. I can't get away from them. They're my favorite thing to talk about. Um, So you can definitely find me on Instagram and learn more. Awesome. And for those of you who don't know, I did a documentary for Nova called Fighting for Fertility. At minute 38, we talk all about one family's journey from mosaic embryo to healthy baby. So check it out if you guys haven't watched it yet. Thank you, Megan, for joining us. I hope you'll come back again and tell us all about your series. And everyone, have a great day. Bye, Megan. Bye. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Vazadin. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. 